ready to go for our next session, which is the Indian Global Collaboration in the Health Sector, Startup Opportunities and Challenges. India is the one of the largest marketplaces in the world. Foreign healthcare players need to understand how the markets work before they enter it. The Indian government is driving universal health coverage and startup opportunities for affordable health care. This panel provides insights on market, market developments in India, including examples of reverse innovations from India to world and back, along with legal and IPR challenges. I please join your hands to welcome Tanya Sisba, Director, Australia India Institute at Delhi. I would now like to call upon Dr. Janus Pikani, Chairman, Scanbelt and Tartu Biotechnology Park. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Yashwan Deval, Independent Consultant. I extend warm wel welcome to Dr. Shiban Ganju, Chairman, Chairman Save the Mother Foundation. Please welcome Dr. Juka Holapa, Commercial Counselor, Business Finland. Please welcome Sharda Balaji, Founder, Novo Juris Legal. I would now like to call upon Tanya Spisba, Director, Australia India Institute at Delhi, to present her keynote. Thank you. Okay, great. So, uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, first of all, I just want to get a feel of who's in the room. So, how many of you have a medical background? Okay, how many technology? And lastly, how many policy, policy or diplomacy? Okay, so I'm in good company on the panel here. Uh, so my name is Tanya Spisbar, I'm the director of the Australia India Institute here in New Delhi, where we foster collaboration and research between Australia and India on four key research themes, including in health. My background is um, international trade and development, with a particular focus in health and bilateral health between Australia and India. So this is a personal passion of mine, but I come from a trade negotiations and legal uh, diplomacy background, not a technical one. So um, I'm going to take you through a bit of an overview, a snapshot of Australia-India collaboration in the field of health and medicine. And then I think from the panel we'll get to hear um, some diverse views from Estonia and from Finland as well. So this is more of an example of how international collaboration can support developments in health and medicine. Uh, so I'd like to take you through basically the overarching architecture of uh, the government-to-government -government collaboration between Australia and India on health. Uh, then look at examples of joint Australia and India medical research that have been undertaken together. I'll then give a few examples of Australian research that has been applied in India. Uh, and then Australian research that is cutting edge and could be applied in India. Uh, highlight some brief opportunities and challenges and then end with some personal observations. So the overall architecture between Australia and India is shaped by the Health Memorandum of Understanding, which was signed um, with uh, witnessed by Prime Minister Modi and Australian Prime Minister Turnbull at the time in 2017. It covers a suite of uh, issues from communicable to non-communicable disease, health system strengthening, and uh, also policy. So one example of policy there is tobacco control, and thanks to Australian and Indian collaboration, particularly between the University of Melbourne and the Public Health Foundation of India here, we now have the 85% warning labels on uh, tobacco products. Uh, so that was something that former Health Minister Nada championed at the time during 
uh, his time as the president of the World Health Assembly. So under the auspices of that broad architecture, and the reason that architecture is important is because it creates opportunities for all actors, not just government actors, um, but for departments or ministries to collaborate together, for startup companies to come together, for industry and researchers to interact with government as well. So that overarching framework provides a very useful tool for which we can engage together. Another example is the Australia India Strategic Research Fund. It is now more than a decade old. It's um, multi-million dollars, and it's funded by both the Australian and the Indian governments. So on the Indian side, it's the Department of Science and Technology and the Department of Biotechnology, DST and DBT, that run the program. Uh, while some of the focuses include agri-tech and other, um, biomedical research is also a very important part of this. And as you can see, some examples highlighted here uh, joint research for biomedical devices and implants, stem cells and vaccines in uh, immunomodulators as well. Uh, so one example I'll highlight here because the previous panel um, spoke of uh, diabetes. Professor Matthew Cooper uh, from the University of Queensland has been working with the Indian Institute of Chemical Technology to also identify um, different potential new therapies for type 2 diabetes. And since I'm not a medical expert, I'm not going to go into the technical elements of it. But um, as you heard from the previous panel, um, the therapies include relying on the, the human body creating uh, proteins in order to support pancreatic function. Uh, another example is partnering between the University of Wollongong and India's Andhra Pradesh MedTech Zone, which is a, um, a really impressive zone of startups uh, that are working internationally with a number of countries, including with Australia. And on this particular example, they're partnering to develop 3D bioprinting techniques. So now I just want to give two examples about um, different types of innovation in health in which Australia and India has collaborated. And I'm very impressed by this one. One, because it's on disability. Disability is something that often gets overlooked. And in a country where we often speak about a triple burden of disease in this country, non-communicable disease, communicable disease, and then the added impact of road trauma and um, trauma injuries. Often disability on its own gets overlooked. Um, but here, under the uh, Ministry of Social Empowerment and Justice, the University of Melbourne is working to develop CBID co-design workshops, which is basically community-based uh, ways of uh, working with the human resource sector. So often the community-based resource workers, um, the CBR workers, have either just finished up to year 10 school, um, sometimes year 12, but often don't have a university background. So it's looking at how we can work with these um, well-intentioned school, um, school leavers to respond to rehabilitation uh, in an inclusive way and to work with community members as well. So this is ongoing work. Um, currently, and a manual is being developed that will be nationwide delivered here through the National Disability Institute based in Chennai. Um, this is another example of Australian research being applied in India. So rather than being a joint collaboration, um, it's an Australian invention. It comes out of the Eliminate Dengue program uh, by a professor, Scott O'Neill, from Monash University. This one is quite extraordinary because, as you all know, um, we're also at the season where dengue is, uh, is currently a, a major problem again this season. Um, but the idea is to try and come up with naturally occurring interventions. So often, I'm sure most of you have seen the, the fogging with chemicals that are used to try and reduce the mosquito populations. So one, that's putting chemicals into the atmosphere. Two, it's having a secondary impact on health. And three, it's also upsetting our ecosystems because it's, taking, it's targeting um, the Aedes aegypti uh, because it's a vector of disease, but it's also trying to eradicate a, um, you know, a part of the ecosystem. So this research is about using Wolbachia, which is a naturally occurring bacteria, and introducing it into the Aedes aegypti the impact is that it inhibits the Aedes aegypti from being a vector for dengue. The Indian Council of Medical Research uh, was very impressed by this um, and by its early trials. It's being trialled in Brazil, Indonesia and Australia. 
And in 2016, under the former uh, director, Somya Swaminathan, who's now, as you probably all know, at the World Health Organization, she introduced this into Pondicherry as a pilot study, which is now doing very well in India also. Um, so I've given you an example of um, disability and HR intervention, one on communicable disease and um, clinical research intervention. Um, I'll just also address Brian Oldenburg's work from the Nossel Institute, also at the University of Melbourne. He's recently this year been awarded a competitive grant from our National Health and Medical Research Centre on interactive digital technology to transform chronic disease outcomes in Australia and uh, lower middle income countries. So I mentioned this one because again, it ties to the previous uh, panel that we just had on diabetes, where um, what was highlighted is an absence of data and an ability to monitor um, a person's blood sugar or um, indicators for cardiovascular disease. So this centre will be creating an, a digital technology platform which allows wearables and other devices to interact um, and be applicable through South Asia so that information from the patient can be then utilised to monitor these non-communicable disease conditions. Um, so as you can see, it's going to promote care pathways in India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh and in Pakistan. Uh, then I just wanted to leave you with an idea of Australian research that um, can be applied in India. So you might have heard of spray-on skin. This was something developed now about 17 years ago, but is still a game changer in the technology today. Uh, it was first applied um, it was first applied in Australia in 2002 during the Bali bombings. Uh, during that time, many people were medevaced to Perth, where Fiona Wood uh, applied her technology of spray-on skin, which allowed skin cells to be um, self-generating after just five days. Previously, it was 21 days. So this type of technology put onto um, uh, first-degree burn victims uh, can be li literally life-saving. Um, a more controversial example is uh, Professor Ian Fraser's HPV vaccine. Um, some of you in the room might be aware that India has tried to roll out an HPV vaccine, but it's been under a little bit of uh, controversy here. Um, the point of the HPV vaccine is that the human papilloma virus can go on to cause cervical cancer, um, which has been uh, which has been quite devastating for um, loss of life for cervical cancer. So the HPV vaccine can help to prevent cervical cancer and therefore save lives. Early rollouts have been controversial, partly due to misinformation on whether or not it in itself um, is something that causes, uh, causes problems. And in addition, there are um, cultural issues as well about providing vaccines for a sexually transmitted disease in this country. However, in Australia, it's been very effective. And as you can see, more than 270 million doses have been administered worldwide. So I've given you a broad overview talking about um, the types of Australian and Indian collaborations that can support health interventions in the non-communicable disease space, communicable diseases, um, and also in human resource innovation, um, like training and research in disability. Other examples here include product innovation. I'm sure we'll talk a bit about digital health um, and innovation and technology, um, the IoT, you know, um, Internet of Things and other types of interventions. Another one is also pharmaceuticals. So India, as I'm sure everyone knows in the room, is the largest producer of pharmaceuticals in the world. However, in terms of its export market, there are still challenges around um, standards and regulations recognition for quality and consistency of pharmaceuticals. So working together to treat that could be um, another area in which we could co cooperate. And I've list listed here some of the other things we could talk about on the panel, including the cost of product development, government support, and localization of medical devices. Um, as we talk about digital health, IoT, and data, data security also remains an issue which we can talk about as well. And this is why it's important that technology experts, medical practitioners, but also policymakers are in the room so that we can address these issues holistically and together. And speaking of holistically, I just want to end with my own personal observation. 
I was very impressed by the last panel on diabetes because it focused very much on preventative health. And I think the idea that individuals become more educated about the drivers for disease is critical. So if we all become more aware of our own needs for diet, exercise, sleep, which all sound very basic, and yet non-communicable disease um, statistics are going up and up in all countries. Australia is one of the countries with the highest incidences of obesity, so is the UK and so is the US. And these are countries that are supposedly leading in the developed world in healthcare. Um, so I think preventative health is key, and the more research we can do on that would be critical. India is home to homeopathy and other traditional medicines like Ayurveda um, that also have incredibly important impacts on human health, both preventative and curative. What's missing, though, are clinical trials and clinical evidence for the allopathic community to take it more seriously and for insurance to properly cover it. So another example of research collaboration could be, in fact, in getting more um, clinical evidence around the utility and efficacy of homeopathic and traditional medicines as well. And lastly, because I don't think it's been mentioned yet, is the focus on the environment. So if you think about um, impacts on health, many of them are either lifestyle or environment um, informed, and yet we often don't have discussions on the environment. In many countries now, with the World Health Organization focusing on antimicrobial resistance, there's an increasing awareness of the holistic need to look at um, the global food supply chain, the use of antibiotics in animals, the runoff, even if you're a vegetarian, of, um, that anti of the bacteria, sorry, of the antibiotics from animals into then water supply and crops, which then again impacts the antimicrobial resistance burden, which is becoming again a large, um, a large global challenge that the World Health Organization has created a global action plan for and which all our countries in the room have a national action plan for. But unless we really you know, properly work with our ministries of environment, ministries of agriculture, ministries of health and ministries of finance to properly coordinate, um, we're going to continue to see problems in antimicrobial resistance. If you look at the top 10 killers of, um, uh, in, the country, in this country, in India, you'll see that diabetes non um, and cardiovascular disease rank highly, but as do upper and lower uh, pulmonary tract infection. And this is again because of indoor and outdoor pollution. So again, unless we take pollution far more seriously and act far more quickly, us living here in one of the most polluted cities in the world are continuously exposed to these kinds of problems as well. And while I've focused on non-communicable disease, it can even be true of communicable disease. So if we think about lack of drainage um, during monsoons or the pileup of garbage, this is obviously where the Aedes aegypti can breed and grow, leading to um, increased risk for uh, dengue and chikungunya, which might otherwise be avoided if we took better care of our environment. So I just want to leave you with those thoughts and observations, and then um, I'll hand over to our chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, may I now request Dr. Janusz Kani to please take over and moderate the session on Indian global collaboration in the health sector. Um. Good morning. Uh, mm, uh, this session is supposed to uh, discuss how to make uh, India great through collaborative actions, uh, which actually means that how to make an um, equation one plus four, one equals four to work and uh, what are the opportunities of uh, from the point of view of different uh, countries uh, which are representative, uh, represented uh, in this panel, uh, what we, these uh, countries could offer to India and, and what India can offer uh, to these countries uh, to make innovation a part of our everyday life and how to further just make uh, the uh, living of um, the population better and to gain, uh, to secure health gain. So, um, 
To start with, um, I would ask uh, what is the Finland could offer to India and what India could offer to Finland from Yukka, who has been working to build up relations between India and, and Finland for, for years already. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jukka Holappa, and I'm, I'm not a career diplomat. I used to have a real job before joining the Finnish government. My education background, I have a PhD in pharmaceutical sciences, and I've been working in the pharma industry most of my life, until three years ago something happened, and my wife told me that, Jukka, you are just spending 200 days per year in an airplane flying around the world, sourcing generics, doing R&D, Get, get an easier job, and now she's so pissed off because I'm traveling even more. Thanks, thanks for the organizers for giving me the opportunity to, to speak here about Finland, what is, what is happening in the, in the healthcare, what is happening in R&D space there. Uh, I will start with a question. Uh, you have three or four minutes to Google the answer. And whoever gets the right answer, I promise to buy a lunch in the finest restaurant in, in, in Delhi. Or in Gurgaon, or in Noida. You can, you can choose. Question is that what is the best hospital in Finland? You have three minutes to Google. By the way, the answer is exactly the same if I would ask that what is the best school in Finland. I will make your life a bit easier. So regarding Finland, small country, 5.5 million people, it's very important that we say the 0.5, 5.5 million people in the middle of nowhere in northern part of Europe. Uh, we have created the most unique ecosystem where startups, SMEs, large companies, academia, and government work together. Why? Because we had to. Because in ten, you know, 10 years ago we were in deep trouble because the mobile phone business of Nokia collapsed. Suddenly Finland was full of unemployed Nokia engineers. Tens of thousands of good people. That was the be best thing that ever happened to a country because those guys uh, went to work in startups, SMEs, established their companies, went to work for the Finnish government. And now it took us 10 years to build the most unique ecosystem. That ecosystem has started to attract all the multinational companies to come to Finland to do R&D mostly. We just had the global CEO of Google in Finland a couple of weeks back and he disclosed investments worth of two, million, two billion USD to Finland in different sectors, healthcare being one. Uh, Within healthcare, many global companies are tapping into this unique Finnish ecosystem. Uh, uh, connectivity is a big area. Everybody's talking about 5G. We are working on 6G already. Uh, for example, GE Healthcare has focused all the wireless R&D to Finland. Again, small country in the middle of nowhere. Uh, AI is another uh, area that many multinational companies are tapping in the Finnish, Finnish ecosystem. IBM, their AI platform, Watson, so a lot of the healthcare R&D actually is, is done in Finland. Few words about our healthcare system. When you measure the outcomes of the healthcare system, usually there are three countries which come on top. It's Norway, Switzerland, and, if, and, and Finland best health outcomes. But then when you start to look at how expensive the system is, the Finnish system is about the half of the price of the Norway and Switzerland system. So I think that we in Finland, we managed to, to, to create the best health, health outcomes. 100% uh, of our health records are in electronic format nowadays. We have created the register where all the prescriptions are, whether you go to the public healthcare or the small private he healthcare that we have in Finland, you can log online and see all of your prescriptions. What is happening next 
is that you can start downloading all the data from your call devices to this register. So when you go to the doctor, he or she sees your prescriptions and your health data as well. Maybe the coolest and latest development in Finland around healthcare R&D uh, is our biobanks. In Finland, we we are the only country in the world where in the biobank you can combine the full genomic data of a person to a full medical history of a person. And considering that our me you know, medical records are wonderful, 30, 35 years of, of history in somewhat isolated gene pool. So the data is excellent. Uh, we also created the most modern legislation which em enables the use of, of this data. Next thing we are doing is that we are building a model that each one of us will get monetized if our data is used. And these Finnish biobanks, during the last 18 months, we have seen 10 of the largest multinational pharma companies setting up R&D units to Finland. Ten largest pharma companies have set up R&D units to Finland to dig into our biobanks. So that's a cool thing. Everybody's talking about data. So we have the data and you can use it and we will get monetized if, the data is, if our data is used. Uh, why should you look at Finland? We usually we don't have an idea how to market and sell. We are wonderful engineers, but we don't know how to sell sell Finland. But, you know, it's the best ecosystem in the world. Everybody else is there. All the multinational companies are doing R and D in, in in Finland. Maybe you should be there as well. Uh, most unique data available, as mentioned. Attractive fund uh, funding. So our organization alone. We are also funding, our annual funding budget is about 600 million euros that we injected to Finnish innovation ecosystem every, every year. And many Indian companies are actually tapping into that funding as well. To us, it doesn't matter who owns the company as long as it's registered in Finland and we can fund that. Also, the venture capital money is flowing to Finland. I just uh, saw an article which said that last year, 10% of the global startup exits came from Finland. Again, country of 5.5 million people. 10% of the global startup exits came from Finland. So also, the, not, not only the multinational companies have realized that they need to be in Finland, but also VCs have realized that there's something special about the country without startups. Uh, that's maybe a snapshot. Uh, anybody has answered to my question, what is the best hospital <coughs> in Finland? I think University Hospital? No. Your nearest, whatever hospital is the nearest to you, is the best hospital in Finland. Same, same answer with the school. What is the best school in Finland? Whatever is the nearest school in Finland. Okay. Thank you, Jukka. And uh, I can only add that uh, there is uh, in the region of Baltic Sea, there are many good examples, and one good example is that not only Finnish uh, system uh, is uh, good in Finland, but uh, from the 1st of July this year, electronic prescriptions, which are actually prescribed in Finland, are valid in Estonia and vice versa. So, because also in Estonia, 100% of prescriptions are electronic, so if patient gets a prescription in Estonia, uh, she or he can step in in a pharmacy in Finland and get a, uh, a drug and vice versa. So this is now the first cross-border collaboration. It's, it's this scale that people can use uh, their sort of health data and go abroad and get services. So, um, but maybe we can just switch uh, a bit to a bigger scale and uh, talk about the US. Of course, India has quite 
long history uh, with uh, towards U.S. and I think um, there is not a single multinational based in U.S. where you don't have senior management, including Indian origin, origin uh, originated people. So uh, I would ask uh, Dr. Shiban, uh, what you could actually talk us about U.S.-India relations in uh, uh, starting businesses. Thank you. Um, I met him outside. I told him, don't talk that macro level. I can, I'm a micro level worker. I can explain uh, more at a micro level. Uh, I've done some startup, startups in the U.S., uh, but my most successful startups have been in India. Uh, while I lived in the U.S. for many years and worked in University of Chicago Hospital with uh, side uh, ventures in uh, electronics to healthcare. Um, but I moved back to India because this is where the action is now. Um, if you look at Indian history, these hundred years come but rarely in the history of a nation. We have a window now, which probably was in Chol Kingdom, Magad area, maybe Shah Jahan's times, and now we have it now. If we don't capture it now, I feel myself so lucky to be alive now than participating in it. Even if you fail, it doesn't matter, but you can claim they did participate in this resurgence. Uh, so in this resurgent thing, what we have done is gone to I'm a doctor, so I look from, I'm a little well-versed with healthcare. We've gone to traditional medicine. Um, of course, the funding came from the U.S., initial funding came from the U.S. Um, to get it started. Now, we have a 15-year-old company called Atrimed. Atriya was the teacher of Sushrit and Charak. Uh, so in his name, we started this company 15 years ago. Uh, we look at phytochemicals, chemicals from the plants to prevent or cure disease. And uh, by now, we have the most probably the largest library of phytomolecules in the world readily available for anybody to collaborate with us. In fact, uh, I was here late yesterday because IIT Kharagpur uh, is on board with us I was in Kolkata yesterday trying to get that wrapped up. We were also, incidentally, ma'am, with the University of New Queensland, our delegation went there because the Prime Minister of uh, Queensland visited our uh, lab, and she was so impressed as she invited us there. So our team went there. We also met the people in Jeffrey University. So we'll see if something comes out of it, uh, only because we put a lot of hard work uh, to build something into the thing. And now we have uh, bigger institutions here like Ames on 24th of November. We're doing a session for them. And uh, other institutions trying to collaborate with us because this is our heritage. The problem was that we never gave it a scientific color after 180. Uh, number two, um, everybody's truth became his personal truth like uh, Sachin was saying. Uh, hit on the point. Uh, so we infusing science into it uh, from development to clinical trials and so on and so forth. But having said, look at, looking at India, most of the world looks at India as a market. At the moment, I can tell you it is a developing market because we sell our products both in India and abroad in about 37 countries. So India cannot pay that much for the same products. So we have differential pricing for low-income countries and high-income countries and we cross-subsidize at a, at a company level. Uh, so looking at pure market at uh, international prices, international companies are not likely to succeed. Uh, so one has to look for frugal innovation, which is where I come to the next point. India for the next 10, 15, 20 years should be considered as an R&D hub. Um, you can produce the same drug or same gadget or same innovation or same IT system 
or same public health system at a much lower price. The good news is India has no legacy, so we can start afresh with 150 years of world's healthcare experience. How can we plug that into improving whether you do public health or you do innovation at a high-tech areas? To give you an example, the cost, you'll be shocked to know. Uh, just two months ago, we started a program. I also run a non-profit organization. Um, uh, in Muzaffarpur, Bihar, where the encephalitis deaths happen every year. The range is from anywhere 200 to 500 children die under the age of 10. Every summer, you must hear the lychee deaths, etc. So I went and visited there, so we said we're going to start a program. Our cost per capita, you'll be shocked to know, for next three years we run the program, I promise that we'll decrease it by 75% in Minapur, which is the block in Muzaffarpur where the highest incidence of um, encephalitis deaths happen. The cost per capita is four rupees per year. And we'll be able to deliver this. We started another program in Indo-Nepal border um, and um, Bahraich, where I was just a couple of weeks ago and I'll be going again next week, um, where one of the worst districts in India if you ever want to cry on a data table, not a story, not a video, not a movie, just a data table, look at the health indices of Bahraich. If you don't cry, then you're insensitive. It's a horrible state of affairs, Indian-Nepal border. Um, so we started working there. A cost per capita per year is about 11 rupees. That's the, at the lower end how you prevent public uh, deaths, unnecessary deaths, preventable deaths. We've done it before, so our cost has been the same for the past 11 years, um, where we decreased maternal mortality from 420 in Gadag district. In the last 18 months, there's been no mother has died, zero. Um, in Amethi, where we worked, in 700 Amethi, the high-octane high district, we, leave, we keep them away from us, but purely healthcare in the last um, six months, um, there has been no death, maternal death. We've been population stabilization. People talk about it from podiums and think it's a very complex issue. To us, it's not. Uh, contraceptive rate has increased in Amethi from 10% five years ago to 62%. 62% girls and women take contraception now, and under 18 marriage in Amethi in the villages that we work. By the way, we work in a large number of villages. We don't just do one or two. We work in 700 villages in Amethi. Under 18, death is close to zero. Under, under 18, marriage is close to zero. So that's the cost of doing business for prevented medicine, and I like the international collaborators to come and work with us, teach us, or maybe pick up some points from us. Now moving on to the high-tech side, we also have this tradition of Ayurved in India. At least 2,500 or 2,000 year old legacy, if not more than that, maybe it's 5,000 years old. Uh, where uh, Ayurved has two strands, one is the mind-body medicine, yoga, meditation, etc., which is already spread everywhere else. But there's another element to it, and that's the plant-based therapeutic medicines, uh, which was never looked at that point of view. To us, people who are trained in science, a plant is a factory of chemicals. Um, and since plants came into evolution much before humans came, two billion years ago, and the human mind got in the pharmaceuticals just about 190 years ago, Merck, the largest company, is only 190 years old, so to me, it is uh, quite obvious that nature must have produced in evolution many more um, phytomolecules than the human mind, which itself is a product of evolution, has produced 190 years. And lo and behold, they are there. We have produced um, therapeutic molecules out of the weeds that go to the streets of Bangalore. Um, we have classified, we have this mapping AI-powered engine and that if you tell me a molecule, I'll tell you which plant it comes from. If you tell me a plant, I'll tell you what molecules goes there, and I'll tell you where it 
connects with the receptors in your body, so on and so forth. So we have a very large, vibrant, in silico lab. <coughs> then we do um, experiments in the lab in vitro, and then we do the animal modeling. We've done only but small chemical uh, clinical trials because they're expensive. Doing clinical trials are expensive. So you need collaboration there. And I'm proposing to Ames and Delhi we should do a collaboration psoriasis. And we are open uh, for ideas, collaboration, um, one way or two way or reverse. And our library of uh, 400,000 uh, phytomolecules are available for anybody to research and collaborate with us, which includes, incidentally, I was in Helsinki this couple of weeks ago, extraordinary country. And I've been an admirer of your um, putting genomics into the EHR uh, many years ago, the first country, uh, uh, that every, every citizen in Finland has their gene pool, uh, genome data in the, in the, in the, in the library. The, the key reason I'm saying is this, we work up with about three, three million people, uh, from Muzaffarpur to Gadak to Indo-Nepal border to UP. Here's a possibility of creating a whole genomic bank of three million people. The problem is, again, we don't have a frugal innovation to a genetic um, complete uh, gene, gene analysis in India costs about anywhere from eight to 12,000 rupees, which is too expensive. So we're looking at innovations, of frugal innovations. Can we do um, some subset of genomes, maybe just study a few genes, or even cut the cost of doing gene analysis and with we have access to about three million people and create a whole genomic bank uh, to see what happens in India and the genes. Similarly, with uh, uh, the university in Australia, I'd like Madam to help us out. We can collaborate there also doing phytomolecular research. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. So yes, so the genomic research is uh, starting more and more important, and not only in research, but also there is a good example for uh, introducing a genomic risk uh, profiling to the everyday medicine. And for example, Estonia, where I'm coming, is now doing a first pilot where the public health system is using uh, uh, genomic information, because in Estonia we have also one of central genome bank where 20% of all adult population has already genome maps, uh, comprehensive genome maps, which means that now the feedback to the population has started uh, to be delivered through uh, the real practical medical system where breast cancer prof uh, risk profiling and cardiovascular risk cancer profiling has been piloting. So we will get the first results in two years, and then pharmacogenomics will be followed to be added to the electronic prescription to the, uh, every doctor's sort of uh, uh, desktop. But um, I think we can now move to cr cross Pacific from if we talked about some good examples of collaboration. Uh, from, from US uh, to Japan, and Yash, you probably can give us a more wider picture what is going on with collaboration between Japan and, and India. Thanks, Janos. Good morning, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. V.K. Singh and Sachin for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I think uh, this Inno Health Initiative itself is one of the you know great initiative I have seen, and I must thank them because it's very diverse. And I, you know, this is one of the event where I am participating. Normally, I don't go, but looking at the seriousness of the you know uh, topics, panels, and this very well uh, you know managed event. So coming back to my name is Yashwant. And now I have uh, working as a freelance advisor. I work with uh, Yuka also on some certain projects with uh, you know Indo Finnish, uh, especially for the government sector, Niti Aayog and railways and other places. 
But today I'm representing uh, one of the Japanese uh, media company called Asai Shimbom, which is 150 years old newspaper and the second largest in the world. And uh, we are basically, you know, primarily into the media and a little bit in real estate in uh, Japan. But now we are thinking of uh, getting into venture capital. So we would be, you know, helping Indian startups getting into Japan. And the healthcare is one of the, you know, recently uh, opened up area in Japan. We because we have very fantastic healthcare system. But uh, as you know that, uh, you know, uh, in Japan, 27% uh, of total population is uh, above 65 age. So we have a lot of health challenges. And where we are looking for, uh, you know, certain um, Indian companies to get into Japan healthcare system, primarily into uh, medicine and AI. Because we have decided, as a Japan had decided that they'll have at 10 AI-based uh, hospitals by 2022. So this is a big opportunity in Japan. And secondly, you know, during last visit of uh, Modi ji, so Abe San and Mr. Modi have uh, signed one uh, memorandum of collaboration under which healthcare is one of the biggest focus. Third thing is, uh, we have created funds of fund, which is $187 million, in which we will pick up 200 Indian startups for funding. And this will be, you know, uh, handled by JETRO, which is a Japan external trade organization. And uh, we have started one um, Indo-Japan uh, startup hub in Bangalore, with, I think, with the IIM Bangalore also. So this JETRO would be doing the you know, matchmaking between Indian starts up, startups and uh, uh, Japanese companies. And one of the biggest potential in Japan is for Indian Ayurveda, especially the medicine part. But there is a lot of challenge I could see because you know, if you look at India-Indo-Japan uh, trade relationship, Japan is third largest partner in India when it comes to the investment. But if you look at the reverse side, looking at Indian exports in Japan, we come at 17th position. So it is primarily because of the quality consciousness, their certifications, and you know some of the compliances. So for which uh, we need to you know train our people, we need to be little quality conscious on that. But it's a big market because uh, you know uh, they rely more on Ayurveda, but it's you know not available there. So these are the few things we have done. And uh, I'll just read out that memorandum of cooperation also, which will give you a little idea about what all we have included in this. See, this is between uh, for the promotional institutional collaboration on patient data analysis and information and communication technology and artificial intelligence in medicine. India-Japan Innovation Hub in India establishing high-end mobile BSL-3 labs facility in India and collaboration on getting high-end medical devices, including point-of-care diagnostic, with a special focus on establishing manufacturing units. So this is all, you know, I can brief you on Japan. So if any one of you need any kind of information, I'm always available on my email. So I'll try to get you, you know, if any government agency is involved, I'll connect you with them. And you're most welcome to interact with me. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Yash. Um, so if it comes to the real uh, cooperation, then there's always uh, problems. And where there's the problems, there's the lawyers. <laughs> or if we predict some problems, we we'd want to do some uh, prevention and start to in involve lawyers before. So, Sharda, in your practice, what are the, the obstacles? The, every life is not always so bright and, and prosperous like we think initially when we start our projects. Can you elaborate a bit, Sis? Thank you. 
and uh, lawyers are not to be thought of only when there are problems, but you will think of them to prevent them too. So let me start off with opportunities itself. So the opportunity that we have is obviously the big country, the large population, but interestingly, the mobile penetration is the largest in the world. And with it come a lot of opportunities. And um, like uh, Shiban said, it, it's, it's a fantastic time to be in and to be a participant in this era where there are tectonic shifts happening in technology. And I think um, this conference kind of brings all of them so beautifully together, the health practitioners, the technology guys, um, various of the business folks, the investors, I do angel investments, and for me, I'm always looking out for very interesting um, companies or startups that we can invest in. Um, what we are seeing as opportunity and what I'm seeing right now is uh, most of them are happy being the aggregator models of, you know, find a doctor, find a nutritionist, find a gym kind of a, uh, business models. Then there are some which are kind of going beyond and uh, trying to see, um, you know, there's so much of fake drugs, for example, and one of my portfolio company is coming up with uh, a, a, a blockchain-based technology to identify the source of how the whole uh, drug is moving from the manufacturer to the end distributor to the end customer. Um, with the technology itself, there is a whole opportunity of um, um, democratizing the distribution networks, uh, you know, the mobile internet, smartphone, etc. itself is becoming the distribution network. And like Amazon did for FMCG companies, I think a lot of these um, technology-based companies will do it for the current set of uh, healthcare providers, be it hospitals, etc. Um, I'm seeing a lot of AI in diagnostics, making it uh, making uh, um, healthcare available at the point where uh, the patient is. Um, and I'm, I work with Sigtapal very extensively where they kind of bring in the di smart technology into diagnostics itself, into the device itself, and wherever is the patient, it just gets collected and um, uh, moves on the cloud and the the whole diagnostics is happening at one place. Um, India is about affordability, and we are very, very value conscious. And typically, when we do get companies from outside India, Janus, the, the number one issue that we face is the pricing itself. And, uh, you know, we've worked with one of the company which does um, healing using music. We met, both of us met together. And there's no way an Indian hospital will afford a 15 lakh rupees for a bed. And that was our inputs to him. Um, doing business in India do come with challenges. And some of them are, you know, it's better. And I always advise people who are uh, setting up business in India to kind of start off with perhaps testing the waters a bit. And that could be through uh, making the products available to the distribution mechanism through the distributors and stockists, um, get that comfortable, and then perhaps move to, uh, or maybe do the licensing of the IP on the product. We do have very strong IP legislations, uh, very protective, but uh, because we are a large country and uh, you know, it's very, uh, there's some, there's a term called jugad. You know, you make do with small. Um, because of which, you know, the most expensive one also gets converted into a cheap, possible, usable, affordable, distributable product. Um, however, our, it, it's, it's, of course, that's where you need your lawyer to help you out when you are licensing the product. Um, moving on, perhaps maybe have a joint venture if possible. Um, so the with the local partner who can, who knows the terrain very well, and uh, incoming uh, either from Japan or from Finland, etc. They have the local partner who can, uh, you know, ha also have a skin in the game um, in terms of uh, you know 
making the product available, distribution, marketing, uh, people, working with people becomes easier and uh, you know, more uh, robust. And once you know, the comfort is built is when they can come on their own as a, you know, have your own subsidiary in India and start off as a private limited, starting your own business in India. It's a huge market and uh, you can have as large a market which can go for an IPO as well in India. Um, the main challenge though that I see in India is um, the deep science research itself. Um, there's a lot that's happening in the country, but we are so disjointed because of the largeness uh, that we don't know what's happening in the other part of the world, uh, other part of the country. Um, but nonetheless, the deep science is where I think we are missing the, uh, the edge that we have. We have the history of uh, yoga and alternative medicines like they sweetly put, but it is so much larger than that. Uh, but we are missing um, the deep science research that can actually give us the edge. And therefore, it becomes essential that we do the collaborations with the countries where there, there is that kind of research happening. For example, in Israel, that you have universities doing extensive collab uh, research in the universities. And we have Tata, the largest of our company actually investing in those universities, but we don't get a, that big a check to an Indian university. You know, you feel pinched when that doesn't happen. Um, I think that is where, uh, you know, somewhat like Eno Health kind of comes in beautifully to bring in multifaceted people to come and um, talk about, like she put in so beautifully that researchers, policy makers, health practitioners, universities, funds, investors, everybody kind of come together. I think that is the opportunity that we need to bring in to India um, in a very large way. Thank you, thank you. Doing business is very often based on, on very small, and success is based on very small and technical and down-to-earth factors, like uh, how difficult it is to start a company, how complicated is a bureauc bureaucracy, what is a tax system. So what, how you compare India, in this sense, of, to the other global scene or other, co other countries? Oh, that's a wide one. Imagine me telling a Jordan person uh, on tax, what is tax? Because they don't have it. And then I take her through tax and goods and service tax, how much a nightmare it is. I lose her in between because she can't understand the concept of tax and income tax and corporate tax and talk about GST. We have 13 different kinds of taxation system. It's just so hard. And it's not one national taxation we had. GST is one, but then think of central excise at your factory outlet to you know, moving the product across and octroi in some, con uh, in some states. It's just so difficult. Um, it comes with the fact that we are a very large nation also. Um, we are getting there. Uh, we are getting there in terms of having the Prime Minister's attention to make ease of doing business. Uh, we have ranked substantially better from uh, 180, 134 to now lesser than 80. Uh, we have jumped several steps. Um, healthcare itself has its regulatory nuances and it is quite uh, extensive even in the US. Compared to US, I feel India is a lot better when it comes to healthcare regulatory mechanism. But doing business itself is a little more bureaucratic. It takes a very long time to get certain of the licenses, which is where we can do a better job, much better job. Thank you. Yuka. you have been here working with Indian companies for a long time. What is your practical sort of experiences uh, uh, in, in this on regulatory or what are the main obstacles what you see if you sort of 
looking for cooperation of, with India and, and let's say, Finland. What, what always surprises me with, with Finns and Finnish companies that, you know, although we do the engineering and manufacturing and design of our products and services so well and so thoroughly, then when we go to inter international markets, we do a deal with the first company that comes and kind of tells us. It's always the same story in India. You know, we can do exclusively whole India. We have direct links to Prime Minister Modi. We can, you know, do everything for you at the Finnish company size deals with the wrong partner. Uh, so I th that's something that, you know, I'm trying to tell the to, to Finnish companies to to just do the homework well enough and to f try to find the right partner. But maybe elaborating a bit on the on the business side. So I'm actually very worried when it comes to business and in, in the in the healthcare space overall because I think that Europe and and India we have lost the war already with the consumer internet. To, to the large American platforms. Chinese, they have their own platforms. And when, when you actually start digging what Amazon and, and Google are doing on healthcare, it is so frightening. Google is working in all the major indication areas. They are vacuuming all the companies and all the technologies. And it's not right that all the money in the healthcare business goes to US in the, in the, in the future. So I think there we need to collaborate between, between Europe and India. Do R&D together. That's what I'm trying to tell the Finnish startups who are working in the healthcare field. Let's do joint R&D with India and then you can come and upscale the products in India and even manufacture stuff in India. To answer your original question, how have I seen, for example, the, the, the Indian landscape, how to do business I, I, improving. It has improved. It, it, it is so, so much more straightforward uh, to do business. Indians actually pay the bills nowadays. They never pay on time, but they actually pay the bills. Because that always was the worry. The, the Indian PSUs, they never paid the bills. After we had huge cases with, with the large Finnish companies like Nokia, get, you know, but, 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 you know, the private companies, they pay the bills, they never pay on time. Thank you. Tanya, maybe you want to elaborate your experiences with uh, Australian companies or, or Australian startups here. Sure, thank you. Um, first of all, I'd just like to draw on Sharda's point about deep science research and the missing edge. I think that's true in my observations. So in terms of looking at useful, impactful collaborations. Um, this is something that India is also trying to address with its policies. So I think it was right to address the ease of doing business indicators. That is certainly something India has been working hard on. Um, but if you look at the, the synergies of the policies and how they might actually support um, medical technology, medical research and startups in these spaces, um, they all build on each other. So you have the ease of doing business indicators, you have the primary health care, national health policy 2017, um, and then complemented that with Ayushman Bharat introduced last year. Ayushman Bharat is well known for being the largest um, insurance scheme in the world, but it does so much more than that. It's also aimed at the um, primary health and wellness centres, which, which is essentially establishing rural health infrastructure, and it's also tied to um, creating or investing more in medical human resources, so human resource intervention, which is also key. Um, the reason I wanted to raise or uh, touch on that deep science research point is because traditionally Indian universities have been very focused on quality teaching, but not necessarily deep research. You can find a lot of applied technology here. So in terms of adaptive, applied, translational science, I think India is one of the most innovative countries in the world when it comes to coming up with um, necessary solutions. So Jugad, as we've mentioned several times on the panel, is often described as a translation of frugal innovation. But to me, Jugad means where there's a will, there's a way. So yes, that means frugal in this context because it's with whatever resources we have, 
we will find a solution. So therefore, I think looking at the incredible innovation and energy in this country, this very mindful solutions oriented nature in adaptive applied and translational science, we can team up with the deep and pure sciences that come out of Europe, Australia, the US and elsewhere. But importantly, I think building research capability in India is also key. So I think partnering at the research level and the deep research level to build a, a stronger deep research base and capability in India is also going to be a huge game changer in um, medical advancement and medical sciences. India is already doing that, not just the primary health care and ease of doing business, but many of you might be aware of the draft new education policy that was put out in July. Already in the budget line this year is the National Research Foundation. So the National Research Foundation will in fact transform research in this country. To date, it's either been done through public institutions like DST or DBT or CSIR, or it's done with um, CSR. So Tata, as was mentioned, um, Tech Mahindra, other, other huge companies also invest heavily in R&D. But it's missing from our public universities. The National Research Foundation will make um, competitive uh, grants similar to what we have in Australia called the Australian Research Council, and I'm sure many countries here have those types of grants as well. They are promotive of things like startups um, because what they do is they, on a competitive basis, require companies, startups, universities to work together on a public or global challenge um, and to bid competitively for that grant. Often the, the competition is, in, is um, sorry, the grant will do better if you are in fact internationally collaborating. Other areas, and I think um, um, my Yuka mentioned this, is in clinical trials which are very expensive. Australia is also relatively small. We're a population of about 24 or 25 million people, which is often laughed out of town here in India as the size of Delhi NCR, which is true. But we're also double India by landmass, and that is often forgotten. So if you have a very small population in a very large country, what that means is problems of remote communities, similar to here, rural and remote areas that rely on telehealth, digital health, um, and other distance, which I think Finland is also very, very good at, and Sweden as well. But this is where we can excel and partner together, because a lot of our problems are the same in terms of um, reaching remote communities and coming up with digital technologies that allow us to bridge that gap and still give adequate um, and effective, affordable, accessible health delivery. So those are just some ways in which we can work together. The clinical trials would be in Australia, given the smallness of our population, phase one and phase two could be done in Australia. We have very high ethical standards and a very renowned globally for clinical care. Phase three is beyond us though. Um, we can take part in global trials, but we can't deliver them. India is, is perfect in terms of population size and medical advancement to cooperate with for clinical trials. And certainly the George Institute and others in Australia um, partner there. We've been speaking on this panel in terms of bilateral relationships as well. Australia, India, Finland, India, US, India, Japan, India, Estonia, India. But there's no reason we can't all collaborate, you know, tripartite collaborations, um, collaborations with France, for example, which is also doing um, very important work in the, in the health space. So I think the more we think in a solutions-oriented way, even medical startups can cut across geographic barriers in order to address global solutions. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we have walked through the issues from what is possible, what is there for India, for uh, 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 India can offer, and also we elaborated a bit about the problems and we saw that there is a lot of going on. With these words, I would like to close this, uh, uh, this session and thank all participants for extraordinary uh, uh, contribution and hope that uh, we can take uh, home some very useful messages and the audience can, of course, access the uh, uh, panel, panelists during the coffee break, as we don't have any more time for, for questions from here. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Janus. Uh, may I also request you to please present a, a moment of, of, as a token of appreciation. <coughs> present to Dr. Janos. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.